Right. Thanks, everyone, for coming tonight. The people that managed to actually log in and sign up. Um, well, we're supposed to be a lot more. I think 16 signed up, but at the end, it's just the four of us. But we'll see. We'll make the most of it. So at the last month's meeting, I can't remember actually how we actually stumbled across Pi Installer, but by pure accident, we came across that. And it looked intriguing, and so um, we decided to have this as tonight's topic. So last night and a little bit today, I had a look into it and compiled a little bit of um, first impressions and some examples and whatnot, what I could sort of like get going with it and potential pitfalls and other problems that I've come across or shortcomings of the library. And um, this is basically what it'll be all about. So first of all, um, Pine Solar is there to basically freeze all um, packet, uh, so applications that you've written into standalone executables. And it can happen either on the Windows, Linux, OS X, and apparently also FreeBSD, Solaris, and AIX. Um, I find it always funny when I see uh, references to AIX. That's when I started, when I did my Unix admin all those years ago. <laughs> and um, personally, I haven't actually seen it in the wild. Um, so, one thing that I thought that it was, but which it isn't, uh, it says it's cross-platform. That means it runs on these platforms, but it doesn't actually generate installers for different platforms. So, it's a, not a cross-compiler. Um, so, if you want to basically, if you're running um, Linux and you want to create a Windows one, then you would have to have a Windows virtual machine. Or if you want to do OS 10, then you have to be on OS 10 and create something there. So it's a little bit of a drawback, but understandably so. Um, however, something that I got it going last night, but couldn't replicate then anymore, um, was that you can, in theory, install Wine under Linux. So that you have basically your emulation layer um, for Windows, that you can then basically install um, Python for Windows in your Wine installation, then install simply just um, with pip, then pi installer, and then basically execute it just like that as well. Um, but yeah, anyway, we'll get to that in a sec. So um, oh, someone else joined. So what? It actually does is it takes a script and it then turns that into executables and it tries to pull in all the libraries that are necessary um, for running your application. Um, and once it's run, um, there will be a dist, a distribution directory, which then will also have a subdirectory called, in this, whatever your script is called, and that contains basically everything in there. So um, if you're using the dash dash clean flag, um, that means it, any changes uh, are discarded and it basically does a clean build. However, it still asks whether it should um, replace um, the generated output. So during the build process, um, PyInstaller creates a spec file, a specification file, which you can then in theory uh, tune if you wanted to, or otherwise you can just use command line flags to add all kinds of other information to it. Um, so there's a simple um, command line here on the Linux for doing a real clean up of what's happening there. So there's a build directory, there's the disk directory, and there's also a pycache directory, and then your spec file. And if you want to get rid of all that, just run basically this uh, command. Oh, yeah, so that was the mini cross compile that I was talking about. So if you have Linux and still want to generate um, a installer for Windows, then you could, in theory, run do that with Wine. I was able to do that once last night, but when I was trying to recreate my Wine setups, um, Python, the Fire, Python, interesting enough, the Python installer wouldn't show up its graphical user interface. So I'm not quite sure what was happening there. It worked initially um, quite well. But anyway, so you basically download, in theory, it might work for you, or maybe I just needed a reboot. Um, so you can, in theory, just download a Python installer for Windows 32 rather than 64-bit. That's what was working for me. Run that with Wine, 
pops up basically its usual user interface you go through and install for all users including pip and whatnot and then you have a decent enough uh, environment and then you can just basically open a command prompt the windows command prompt with wine cmd and then in there basically just call l then pip install pi installer and you have pi installer in that environment and then you go to whatever directory you basically have your project with a cd command and then just call from the pi installer and your script just basically like under linux and that will generate windows executables then for you so sometimes you might actually have an setup pi um, project rather than just a simple script that you want to turn into something um, was a little bit disappointed there because I hoped that it actually reads setup pi and requirements and all that um, to pull out what the dependencies are um, and what the entry point is, what the main application basically is. However, you basically have to create another little script outside this package structure and then basically import just the main method that you have in the actual script that you want to run. And then that's that. So it's relatively straightforward as well. But it comes with a few, well, pitfalls, um, especially if you just do this quick sort of like um, script where you're importing the main method of your actual script. Um, it doesn't import any libraries in that script, which you're actually handing over to Pi installer. All you can, all it sees is, oh, well, all I can see is just OS or maybe sys or not even anything like that and just a one library and doesn't actually import any other um, dependencies so you can use then the dash dash hidden import command line option to supply other things like if you have numpy or other things you can list them all there or you can supply them once you've generated things in the dot in the spec file as well and list them there so one other thing that I found out that um, the dependencies that you're trying to include in your installation then in Pi Installer have to be part of the same environment. For instance, if that's a virtual environment, you have, then you have to install Pi Installer in that particular virtual environment as well. So you can find them all binary um, shared objects, DLLs and whatnot in order to make things work. There's also options um, to not just add .py files, which it usually does by default, but also other things, um, non-binary files and binary ones. And I think the only thing that is different there that it actually um, compresses things. And it has a simple sourced destination format. And the Linux is separated by a colon. and the Windows, it will be a semicolon. It just uses the path separator then. And yeah, so, and the destination basically refers to where in the output directory it should be, not an absolute path. So, um, so both are relative and both should be then sort of like, um, so you can have um, somewhere dot something goes into dot something else, um, all relative then. I'll show that later on in an example. It can generate um, several different um, outputs. So one, which is the default, is the one directory. So in your distribution directory, it creates another subdirectory, which will house basically all the files that you need and other subdirectories from other libraries and whatnot. And that in, with that approach, you can then simply zip it up um, and then ship that to your client, for instance, or to your users. There's the other option is, which is quite neat in a sense, um, it's called one file. Um, it basically takes all the files that are in the output directory and then package those all in a single file. And then what happens at runtime when you're actually starting that executable it has to unpack all the files that are basically in this executable archive and then starts the actual executable from within there <clears throat> it uses the temp directory for that however if the application crashes for some reason it may leave temporary files lying around and depending on how stable the application is or due to other problems that 
uh, the crash occurs, then you might end with a lot of end up with a lot of uh, temporary files that not get uh, not getting cleaned up in the temp directory. And of course, having to decompress an archive and then launching the actual application makes it, of course, also slower than um, a one-time unzip that the client does and then just starting it from there. Finally, rather than just reusing the uh, script name without the .py um, for the output name, um, you can also basically supply a dash dash name, what the name of the output directory or single file that you want to generate should be. And since I've just recently actually done a little bit with GTK under Linux, I was wondering, because it's mentioned on its website, yeah, you can do Tekinta, you can do PyQt and whatnot. So I was wondering, oh, does it actually do GTK as well? Yes, it does. <clears throat> it definitely works and you can start up your application from there. But I've noticed that um, it was also packing all the themes and icons, which turned out to be like something like seven or 800 megabytes, which wasn't quite feasible. So you might have to um, sort of prune themes and icons a little bit and figure out what that is. So you will probably have to have some post-processing steps before zipping things up. Um, but yeah, but anyway, it works. Right, so that is basically what I had in quick presentation just going through. And please keep in mind, I've only been <laughs> working with Pi Installer probably for two, maybe three hours ever since. So um, it is definitely not a library that I'm intimately familiar with. But I do have um, a few examples prepared which I'm going to show now. All right. Um, might actually... oh. yeah. I'm just going to keep an eye on the chat. Right. So we do have... Um, first example is really, really, really simple. So all that there is is a Python script that prints hello world, nothing else. So real simple. Um, in requirements, all I have to do is basically a Py installer to have that. So if you want to, I can uh, basically recreate um, that virtual environment. So um, um, oops, three. just installing it and then it's a very lightweight um, virtual environment and in order to run that so um, all we need to do um, is basically running this command here, so from our virtual environment. I'm too lazy for activating it because I'll be switching between virtual environments. So I can just use the, the path from there um, to call Py installer with my hello world py. It takes a wee while. Oh, okay, that's done things. And you can see now I have my py cache so it compiled basically my hello world into c python um, i have my build directory for all kinds of other things in there whatever it does i haven't looked too much into it and then the disk directory where i now have my um make that a bit larger have my um hello world subdirectory and i have a all kinds of shared objects and um, also my hello world file. So if I go um, in there, so if I then look at file hello world, yep, so it's a 64 bit um, elf uh, executable. And um, I can then basically 
run that and it outputs hello world so nothing exciting but only exciting in the sense that it actually worked so if i wanted to um for instance change something the code oops, that's one. so we can do that and then one pi installer again this time we're also using the dash dash clean flames okay, i have to go on the right directory Cleaning it. Yes, I'd like it to be removed and then it's finished. I go on this now. Still basically looks the same. Um, and now run Hello World, it outputs two lines. So, relatively straightforward in compiling something. Um, and if we're looking at how much space is actually using so it's 15 megabytes um, which is not too bad um, considering that it's a simple two-liner it's still a bit but anyways we want to make it so that we actually have executables rather than python code so that people don't have to create virtual environments have to know how to do that off in the first place probably even installing Python on their system, adding that maybe to their path, then installing pip if that not doesn't automatically come like sometimes in Windows, then actually installing your library, then all the dependencies, and if it's like on Windows or something, they don't have a compiler and things don't compile, so it's just a big mess. Um, and yeah, well, if you want to use Anaconda, then it might just gobble up your hard drive in the process. So, uh, I mean, using my hello world example that you could argue me that actually looks promising so let's look at the next one um so i'm just gonna recreate that as well um so i'm just gonna use my little shortcut here um, requirements So in this case, I have in my requirements file, I have not only PyPy installer, but also NumPy. Um, and if I now look at, so in this case, I also have a little, actually, I don't need that one, sorry. Um, two. Um, as a simple setup, um, installation um, just some usual blah the packages to look for and also requires numpy and i have an executable here that i can run so um, for instance if i would install it in here um, then i would have um, a devs run but uh, which basically just outputs a little three by two, or depending on how you look at it, three rows and two column matrix and numpy with random values in there. Um, so really simple as well. Um, but I want to actually create an executable from that now. So I'm just going to recreate my virtual environment ah. sometimes typing is quicker okay <clears throat> so if I look at that not much more basically just numpy being added and now I can see what I can't um, so in this case, we'll just assume I'll just create it. Um, so we're using our same 
file installer approach, um, I've created my little runner script here, which is really just importing from the actual Python uh, file that I want to execute the main method and then executing it. So there's nothing fancy in there. So if you look at the um, that particular run method, which imports NumPy and traceback, it basically really just the main method has create me a random matrix and I'll put that. And that's basically what this runner then basically calls. Nothing to it. So if I um, do a runner, pushing it through, and then go in my this directory and run that. Oh, you bastard. This time it actually worked. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Mm. Because that didn't work previously. <laughs> um, that's interesting. Let's have a look at the spec files. Yeah, looks like this time it actually managed to get that going. Anyway, my point was, if that shouldn't work, which it funnily enough did, um, then you can use the hidden um, so we go clean, and we have a hidden import uh, where we then can say, please install NumPy. Place it. And then we can try that again and I'll put something as well. So that works too. No harm there. Okay. I might just change what I have there. Um, um, Updating here as we go. Cool. Anyway, so, well, that's actually more successful than it was supposed to be, but that's all right. At least with that, we can actually pull in dependencies. And if we now look at how much disk space it's actually using, so, well, pulling in NumPy is adding a little bit. Now we have 56 megabytes already. Um, but at least NumPy, you only pull in once, and you can do a lot with it. All right. So, in the next example, that's actually where I was looking at whether I can do something with GTK. So, in this extremely small example, it's just um, from the Python GTK 3 tutorial, where we are just basically displaying a window with a single button, which then outputs on the console hello world when you do that and then also when uh, the window is sort of like um, being closed um, that means it quits um, the main loop so look at my requirements <clears throat> so i have a little bit different so i'm just gonna remove my virtual environment again so in this case I have PyG objects, so that's the um, introspective way uh, for Python to um, have access to GDK objects. So that's basically what is here with the import GI. That's a GDK introspection, or the G object introspection. Um, and from there, from the repository, we're wanting to have GDK. So we just recreating my virtual environment so you can see that I'm actually not cheating too much 
and storing your requirements. And uh, looking at my notes, so I'm basically just installer in my Go script. Net. Doom, 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 doom. You notice that it's taking already a little bit longer than previously. Uh, even the NumPy one was quite a bit faster. Now we're waiting. Waiting. Oh, we're done. Excellent. So if I then have a look in my dist directory, then ooh, there's a lot more in there. But we still have a GUI um, executable. So if I then look at that, ta da, I have a little button which I can click Hello World, or if I close it, then it exits. So it definitely works. Now, if I look at how much space is taking up, well, it's 1.1 gigs. <laughs> um, so that's actually, there's a lot of small files. So the actual byte, bytes that it uses is actually lower, but thanks to the lots and lots of small files, it actually takes up 1.1 gigs in um, blocks. So yeah, not the best. So if we're then looking at um, the distribution one, so in the share one, we can see that it has um, the icons in there. And if I look at this space, that's 660 megabytes stored in there. So it's all the different icons that I actually have in store. So in theory, we wouldn't actually need all of that, so we can could probably do some pruning there. So then we can just try, I think. I'm actually not sure. So you I don't know why we just need the default one. What's the default? Use that wide. I'm not sure where how it actually determines i definitely don't have that one i do have mint on the icon is high color windows i was just best that that's safe not a lot <laughs> uh, anyway that's probably something to play around with. Uh, we can see whether that actually still works. Yep, so that still works. Um, what if I deem that white? No, Marty in there. And then get rid of all index. Mm. Yep, that still works. Um, see what happens if I delete all the Y ones. Yep, that still worked. Okay. Um, if I remove the latte. Yep. It still worked as well. And for now, look at how much space I'm using all together. Oh, well, I was 130 mix now, which is a little bit better, but still fairly chunky. But at least you could run some post processing scripts on there to make things a little bit faster. Right, last little script that I prepared earlier. So that was, so I'm, I'm actually bring that up. 
So I do use Glide, I quite like it actually, um, for designing user interfaces quickly. Um, so just a really simple one is basically an image in here and an exit button down there. Um, so really, really simple. So if I run that here in the designer, so this is basically what I'm expecting to see. Um, I'm clicking the exit button and closing that. But of course, Glide has its own um, XML file, basically, that it, where it defines its interface in. And we need to supply that, of course, because in our um, in our Python file, we are actually loading that Glide file, and then. Um, retrieving that and showing that. So this is the idea. So if I quickly um, oops, Python, right, good. I run that. Oops. Yeah. This is so this is actually what I'm expecting them to see when I'm loading it, running it as a regular Python uh, file. So <clears throat> what I then needed to do was, I'll just try this time at least, so I'm going to recreate the virtual environment. Requirements. So I'm just showing the requirements. So it's still the same py installer and py g object my requirements. And if I then run my py installer on my Glade GUI py file, Recreating all the icons again. Not a few thousand files, not at all. And then it fails um, basically to load that thing. So if I look um, in my dist file, then I do have my Glade GUI, but the Glade file itself is not there. So what I then need to do is um, we can then use the just going to go up again. We can then use the add data directive to add that basically to our top level output directory then. So if I take this, so I have in this directory where I'm running my Py installer, I have a file called Glide GUI Glide and separated by a colon because I'm on Linux. Windows will be a semicolon. And then dot, that's basically then the output directory, um, which is this Glide GUI, which will be in here. So I'm doing that. I'm also adding clean to it. <clears throat> I'll just have to wait a little bit again. Excellent. So if I now look into this directory, then I now have my Glide file there as well. So if I'm now running it again, then it opens up with my 
design. So that's that. And that basically then concludes my presentation and my examples for tonight. And I'll stop sharing my screen. Cool. I know a lot of people can't really uh, join with audio, but uh, <laughs> feel free to enter any questions that you have in the chat and I'll try and answer them. Or otherwise just chime in and unmute yourself. Ian is typing. Um, I have a question. So yeah. Maybe my question is really stupid. No. <laughs> but, um, if I, I am working uh, with deep learning and some of my colleagues interested to, to learn about deep learning. So for example, I had uh, a script, Python script to run mm -hmm. a deep learning model. And uh, I can run through by installer and a package uh, bundle. Uh, and my uh, that's my assumption. Maybe my understanding mm. wrong. And um, then I just uh, mm -hmm. yeah, keep going. And then you basically want to give them basically this. Here is basically what you can run it and learn a model with your data and everything like that. Yeah, and my yeah. friend can get the. After I run by installer, they have abandoned everything, and I gave it a package to my friends and who have a known nothing about deep learning require any model, and they can run this. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Um. So, I mean, I deal in that space as well, so I do deep learning, quite a bit of deep learning as well. And the packaging, packaging approach that I use there is Docker because you have all the problem with the CUDA libraries. And sometimes you, for different projects, you need different CUDA libraries and whatnot. So Docker makes that easier. Um, and I think the packaging might take too long for that because you will have so many dependencies that you probably package up tens and tens of gigabytes in the end, that it's just easier uh, teaching them a little bit Docker and then just spinning up the Docker image and then either doing it interactively or um, just running Docker sort of like as a container and you just um, give them a command line to run for training sort of like a model or then um, applying it and inside the docker container is basically your python script that does the work but then it has all the environment with the relevant cuda libraries numpy versions and all other um whether that's pytorch or tensorflow or one of these libraries um all these correct dependencies in there and then you know um that will just work as basically a mini operating system then. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, what is the Docker? I, I, that's in my first time to heard that word. I'm oh, the first I... one. Um, Docker is um, some shameless self-promotion here. Um, so I'm just pasting here um, a link in and I'll get to you in in a bit. Um, so Docker is basically a, a lightweight virtualization method. So I don't know whether you use VirtualBox or uh, VMware and all these uh, virtual um, virtualization methods. Uh, some of the original ones were actually emulating a complete computer. So you could run, install an operating system, whether it's Windows, Linux, OS X and whatnot on it. And that's quite heavy because you have to emulate all the RQs and everything on the system. You have to emulate CPUs and everything, graphics card and all that. And Docker um, uses a different route. It basically passes through the kernel of the host system. So you, if you, for instance, run Linux, it basically just passes on 
um, or Linux on a 64-bit Intel chip or IMD chip, for instance, and it passes that through to the container. And then you can install your own Linux operating system in there, but it has access basically to your um, CUDA, um, to your graphics card, and to your RAM and everything. So you can then have nicely encapsulated in that Docker container all the dependencies that you need without interfering with whatever you have installed on your system. So that's what we use a lot on our servers where we have a very lightweight Linux ins installation where we just have the NVIDIA drivers basically installed and then spin up Docker images where we then actually then build um, models with and also apply them. It makes it easier. Also, if you then, um, if you have, so either you can either um, deploy your Docker images to Docker Hub to make them publicly available, or if that's something that you should only use in-house. Um, so we use for our own non-public ones an in-house registry where we can deploy our Docker images to and also pull them from. Um, and then spin them up on server. So you don't, you can just say, oh, run this Docker image and that's it. And it just pulls it from that registry and on any server and just makes it so much easier because you can no longer have to go through the, okay, what do I have to install? What CUDA versions and all that till you have actually everything set up. So it makes it much, much quicker. And the link that I pasted there sort of like, there was a quick introduction um, into Docker that I wrote earlier this year. Um, just to make it um, sort of like as a little sort of like PyTorch example, how that actually works. And then um, talks you through what sort of like the important bits. So Docker can do a lot, but at the end of the day, you don't actually need that much to actually get going. So in your case, long story short, I probably wouldn't use PyInstaller. I would use Docker for doing that. But for other smaller um, sort of like, maybe if it's just projects where you just rely on NumPy or maybe scikit-learn and these things, you can probably package things up. So the things where you don't need uh, deep learning with CUDA and everything, then I think PyInstaller could definitely be a solution. Thank you so much yep. for your help. Um, in, uh, Ian, slide what outputs can be generated. Um, that was the first slide i think um i don't actually know whether it does apk files let me have a look on the website no apk doesn't if you hint let's see whether android shows up no sorry ian so neither android nor apk um shows up um on um, uh, the Pi Installers homepage. So I just looked through and there's nothing in there on read the docs. But yeah, I mean, I always found that packaging Python application was a little bit tedious for Python. So distributing things was is not the greatest strength you either have to be um oh sorry yes i'll get to that um in um so it um people had to know quite a bit in order to get it going rather than oh here's just a zip file and you run it and that's it and it's something I found like with other things like in Java or in, in general, like other C++, C or whatever other development um, tools that was much more straightforward, actually building distributions of your software and then you can just hand it over to someone. So it was much easier. And yes, Ian, you're right. Um, I think it, PineStall is actually being used by Kivi underneath the hood, but I think that the bulldozer then takes whatever it generates and then turns that as a with the because it's a native application it then uses the android ndk tools in order to turn that into an apk file so it probably takes whatever is in the disk directory and then turns that once again um, into some into an apk file so you could i think that's how you can for instance um, probably turn your Python application that you've written 
then into an Android application. But um, you'd probably just go via the Kiwi route then. So that's, that's um, something that we talked about last month with Kiwi, sort of like a cross-platform way of um, designing your applications so that they run on any platform in theory. And you can then also create um, things for it. That's not what I copied. So here's the home page of Kibi if you want to create applications. Um, yeah, so, and coming back to Ian, so that's probably also the reason why uh, generating APK files from Kiwi takes so long because there's so many steps involved. So first of all, it uses Siphon to generate um, sort of like C code out of your Python code. Then it uses PyInstaller to turn and to pull in all the dependencies, generate like libraries and all that, and then packages all that up with um, the native development kit for Android to actually generate an APK file out of it. So that's why I'm not surprised it can take minutes before you have another APK file. And I guess that the, there was the, was it the Kiwi launcher, I think, right, Ian? That probably has a Python environment, which you then can start, I think, rather than compiling things on the phone, but I might be mistaken. Hmm. Ooh. Any other questions? And the question is whether I'd be using it. I'm not sure. <laughs> Most projects that I'm using Python with, they end up in Docker containers, so I don't have to <laughs> um, use that. Um, and I mean, there was one that I'm actually delivering to a client tomorrow. There, I actually use a GTK application, but it was just easier doing um, a pip install in a virtual environment rather than going through the Py installer setup. It's just easier because I had to change things quite frequently, so it was easier pip uninstall off the application and pip reinstall from the repo. It was much easier. It's quite possible that, um, Angus, that profile guide optimization could help with that. And I mean, I'm not sure whether the whether Kiwi has a few sort of like smarts involved for generating those spec files that it actually trims things a bit. Um, maybe there's a bit more going into that, in particular if you're wanting to generate Android, so it actually might take some things out. But um, mm. yeah, I mean, if you look at just adding NumPy, then you have 56 megabytes. <laughs> That's not lightweight. And especially if you need to include other things, if you need to include models or data and other things, then it um, grows quickly 